respected director, uh, director international affairs uh, and office of evaluation faculty and curriculum development OFCD, Lieutenant Colonel retired uh, Khandokar Jehrul Alam. And my dear uh, students, a very good morning from Dhaka. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Kausar Ahmed uh, in front of you today. So Dr. Kausar Ahmed is an adjunct professor at the University of Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed completed his PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of Manitoba, and he holds an uh, MPhil degree in Peace and Conflict Studies from University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and uh, he completed his MBA in Strategic Human Resource Management from the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and he holds a Master of Defense Studies degree from the National University of Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Ahmed was an exchange officer with the Turkish Armed Forces and observer peacekeeper to the United Nations missions in Western Sahara. He's also an alumnus at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, DC. Dr. Ahmed is a research fellow with the Center for Defense and Security Studies, CDSS, and a junior research affiliate with the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, Security, and Safety, uh, TSAS. He was an associate with the Canadian Practitioners Network for Prevention of Radicalization and Extremist Violence, uh, CPNPREV. He leads a Winnipeg-based not-for-profit organization named Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada. Um, Dr. Ahmed is currently a Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada's postdoctoral fellow at the University of Winnipeg. He's also a Rotarian. Uh, his teaching areas include Canada in World Affairs, uh, Terrorism and Counterterrorism, and his research interest includes um, international conflict and its resolution, radicalism, violent extremism, and U United Nations peacekeeping operations. So it's a pleasure for us to have Mr. Ahmed um, with us today. Uh, so I'm welcoming uh, Professor Kausar Ahmed to deliver his speech on the saga of human displacement in the past decades, lessons learned. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank uh, you. BUP te amake dawat dea juno. Uh, Colonel Zahir and uh, 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 Ushiba Borua have not the Dujanke uh, Washington Kodono about the introduction of Juno. Uh, Ami Bangladesh Teke, Dreja Doshe, uh, Ekane uh, Shichi, PhD, Persukor Juno, among a uh, biomotomotic Tikache, but university which update Corona, Ami postdoctoral uh, fellowship uh, Kurechi, Dreja Unishe, out of Sheshwegate, uh, Botsurage, are uh, Airport Equator Ad Achiogulo Conflict and Resilience Research Institute website. I'm involved with a lot of organizations here. So, uh, with this uh, bit of uh, uh, introduction, uh, uh, complimentary introduction, and for a main year, the Japchi, quite a Bishoy Prutume, Jetuita online lecture hobby, Agdorne, online lecture, the Kichu downside, a plus side, a current. আমি আপনাদের সাথে কথা বলতে পারছি এটা বিরাট একটা বিষয় আর ডাউনসাইড হচ্ছে ইন্টারঅ্যাকশন গুলো খুব কম আমি নিজে ভার্চুয়াল এনগেজমেন্টে আসলে খুব একটা ইয়ে করি না রিলাই করি না আমার ইউনিভার্সিটিতে কোভিড হিট করার পরে ইউনিভার্সিটি পলিসি ডিক্লেয়ার করলো যে হাইব্রিড হতে পারে অথবা অপশন আমি সব সময় আপনার ইন পারসন অপশন নিয়েছি so, I want to say that I have 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 to say that I কারণ জহির কাছে আমি পরে প্রয়োজন হলে কিছু লিস্ট পাঠাবো উনি উনাদের সাথে যোগাযোগ করতে পারেন ইফ সামবডি ইজ ইন্টারেস্টেড আর এটা একটা চমৎকার একটা বিষয় একটা সেতু বন্ধন দুটো डिफरेंट কালচার এবং কারণ জহির যেটা রাইটলি বললেন যে টিচিং মেথডোলজি একটু ভিন্ন এবং 
এটা ভিন্নতার অনেক প্রসঙ্গ এবং বিষয় আছে ওদিকে আমি আজকে আর যাব না কারণ আমার স্কোপ ইজ ভেরি লিমিটেড একটা লেকচার দেওয়া সো বাট আমি ওইটার উপরে খুব এমফেসিস করি কারণ জহির যেটা বলেছেন যে আপনারা যারা ভবিষ্যতে এদিকে আসতে চান শুধু ক্যানাডা না নর্থ আমেরিকাতে আমি শুধু নর্থ আমেরিকার ইয়েটা বলবো কারণ এটা খুব আমাদের ক্যানাডা এবং আমেরিকায় মোটামুটি একটা সেম প্ল্যাটফর্ম এবং স্ট্যান্ডার্ড মেনে মানা হয় এখানে টিচিং মেথোডোলজির মেইন ফোকাসটা হচ্ছে ক্রিটিক্যাল থিঙ্কিং এখানে আন্ডার গ্রাড লেভেলে যেমন আমি আমার নিজের অভিজ্ঞতা দুটো আমি দুটো কোর্স পড়াই দুই হাজার উনিশ থেকে ইউনিভার্সিটিতে একটা ক্যানাডা ইন গ্লোবাল অ্যাফেয়ার্স একটা স্পেশাল টপিক্স ইন জিও পলিটিক্স আপাতত আমি টেরিজম অ্যান্ড কাউন্টার টেরিজম নিচ্ছি বাট এটা চেঞ্জ হয় মাঝে মাঝে সো এখানে আমি যেটা ব্যক্তিগতভাবে আপনার ফলো করি সেটা হচ্ছে যে স্টুডেন্টদেরকে থিঙ্কিং অ্যাবিলিটি গুলোকে স্টিমুলেট করা এখানে আমরা এটাতে এতই বেশি মনোযোগ দেই যে আমরা একটা কোর্স আউটলাইন যখন ডেভেলপ করি আমাদের কলিগস যারা আছেন ডিনস অ্যান্ড ডিপার্টমেন্ট চেয়ার ওনাদের সাথে আমরা আলাপ করি যাতে ওনাদের এক্সপিরিয়েন্সটা আমরা নিতে পারি আমরা বিভিন্ন অনলাইন ইয়েতে সাবস্ক্রাইব করি বিভিন্ন রকম কারিকুলা এসে এটা মূল বিষয়টা হচ্ছে যে ওই যেটা বললাম ইংরেজিতে স্টিমুলেট করা এখন স্টুডেন্টকে স্টিমুলেট করার জন্য কিছু বিষয় আছে একজন একজন লেকচার যে লেকচার দেয় তার তো অবশ্যই কিছু নলেজ সাইডটা দিতে হবে কারণ একজন স্টুডেন্ট থিওরিটিক্যাল ব্যাকগ্রাউন্ডটা জানবে কিন্তু ইট ইজ ইম্পর্টেন্ট একই সাথে যেটা আমি ব্যক্তিগতভাবে করি কেস স্টাডিজ আমি একটা পর একটা উদাহরণ টানি যেখানে থিওরিটি থিওরিগুলোকে দেখানো যায় যে এটা আসলে কতটুকু ছিল প্রাসঙ্গিক কতটুকু হয়নি অথবা নিউ আইডিয়াজ অফ থিওরিজ ডেভেলপমেন্ট সেটাও হতে পারে তবে আন্ডার গ্রাড লেভেলে আমরা এর বেশি কিছু করি না আর আমি গ্র্যাজুয়েট কোর্স পড়াই মাঝে মাঝে পিস এন্ড কনফ্লিক্টে পিস এডুকেশন ইন্টারন্যাশনাল ডিসপ্লেসমেন্ট রিফিউজি প্রোটেকশন ওইখানে আমরা গ্র্যাজুয়েট লেভেলে আরেকটা বেশি জিনিস আমরা করি আমরা এক ধরনের গোড়া থেকেই আমরা রাউন্ড দি সেমিস্টার আমি একটা আপনার কেস স্টাডি এবং স্মল গ্রুপ পলিসি এক্সারসাইজ বলি আমি এস জিপিই আমি ওইটা রান করি কারণ এস জিপিইতে ছোট ছোট টিমে দুই তিনজন করে আমার স্টুডেন্টরা কাজ করে এবং ওরা একটা পলিসি বানায় এবং এটা স্পেশালি বোধ ইয়াতে আমি যেখানে পড়াই সেখানে আমরা এটাকে একটা ডিবেটের মাধ্যমে নিয়ে আসি যে একটা হাউস অফ কমন্সে পার্লামেন্টে সো হাউস অফ কমন্সে যদি একটা ফরেন পলিসি ডিসিশন নিতে হয় যে ফর এক্সাম্পল ক্যানাডার ইউক্রেন ওয়ারে পার্টিসিপেট কিভাবে করা হবে এটা কি শুধু অস্ত্র দিয়ে করা হবে নাকি টাকা দিয়ে করা হবে নাকি রিফিউজি ইনভাইট করে করা হবে এই ধরনের কিছু পলিসি টাইটেল আমি দিয়ে দিই তার উপর এই স্মল গ্রুপটা এক্সারসাইজ করে এবং এটা এটা একদিনে না এটা কয়েকদিন ধরে হয় তারপরে ফাইনালি আমরা একটা প্রেজেন্টেশন শুনি এবং পলিসিটা শুনি কারণ ফরেন অ্যাফেয়ার্স ইন্টারন্যাশনাল রিলেশন যে কোর্সটা আমি পড়াই এখানে ফরেন পলিসিটা খুব একটা ইম্পর্টেন্ট একটা বিষয় এবং আমি মনে করি যে আমার স্টুডেন্টদের ওই থিঙ্কিং অ্যাবিলিটিটা গ্রো করা এবং এইটাকে আসলে প্র্যাকটিসে নেওয়া আর ফাইনালি আমি এটা বলবো যে আমাদের এখানে আমরা খুব এমফাসিস দিই লিখার উপর তো আপনারা যারা আসতে চান আসবেন ইনশাল্লাহ আপনারা ইংরেজিটাকে খুব ভালো করে লেখার স্কিলটা একটু রপ্ত করবেন এখানে অনেক বিষয় আছে কারণ আপনার যে অ্যাসাইনমেন্টস গুলো জমা দিবেন ছোট হোক বড় হোক এগুলো সব কিছু ডিপেন্ড করে আপনার লেখার স্কিলের উপর এখানে প্রচুর বাংলাদেশি স্টুডেন্টরা স্ট্রাগল করে এবং আমরা দেখি তবে ওই বিষয়টা আপনারা একটু খেয়াল রাখবেন যাতে লেখালেখির চর্চাটা থাকে আপনারা যে বিভিন্ন জায়গায় লেখেন আপনারা এখন তো অনেক প্ল্যাটফর্ম আছে রাইট আপনারা চেষ্টা করবেন কোথাও না কোথাও পাবলিশ করতে তাতে হবে কি আপনার লেখার ইয়েটার উপরে আপনার এক ধরনের ফিডব্যাক পাবেন তো আমি এইটুকুই বাংলায় বলার চেষ্টা করলাম আপনারা আমার বাংলা ইংলিশ মিশ্রণটাকে ক্ষমা সুন্দর দৃষ্টিতে দেখবেন আমি অনেক দিন দেশের বাইরে এবং ইংরেজি বলতে বলতে প্রফেশনাল কাজে বাংলার একটু ইয়ে হচ্ছে চর্চার একটা অভাব হচ্ছে আর আমি পুরো লেকচারটা ইংরেজিতে সাজিয়েছি কারণ আমি লেকচারটা বাংলায় দিতে পারবো না আমি আই অ্যাপোলজাইজ এটা সম্ভব না আমার দ্বারা এই পর্যায়ে সো আপনারা ওইটাও একটু ওইভাবে দেখবেন যেতে যাতে আপনারা কিছু মনে না করেন বাংলা আমার দেশ বাংলা দেশে আমার জন্ম সো উইথ রেসপেক্ট টু বাংলাদেশ এবং বাংলা ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ আমি এটা একটু বলে নিলাম বিট অফ ডিসক্লেমার আচ্ছা এখন আমরা শুরু করব শুরুর আগে আমি ট্রেডিশনালি যেটা করি স্টুডেন্টদের জন্য আপনারা সবাই ইয়াং সবাই বিশ থেকে পঁচিশ এই ব্র্যাকেটের মধ্যে আশা করি আপনাদের আপনাদের মধ্যে তিনজন ভলেন্টিয়ার যে কোনো তিনজন আমি র্যান্ডমলি সিলেক্ট করতে চাচ্ছি না আপনারা আমাকে 
তিনটা প্রশ্ন আপনারা করবেন প্রশ্নটা হবে আমাদের টপিক নিয়ে যে হিউম্যান ডিসপ্লেসমেন্ট কেন হয় এবং হিউম্যান ডিসপ্লেসমেন্ট নিয়ে আপনাদের বেসিক ভাবনা কি আপনারা আমাকে বাংলাতে বলতে পারেন আমি এটা নোট করে নিব তারপরে আমরা তারপরে আমরা আমি ফর্মাল লেকচারে ঢুকব তো আপনারা অ্যারাউন্ড টেন ফিফটিন সেকেন্ডস একটু চিন্তা করেন আমি জানি আপনারা কিছুটা হয়তো ভেবেছেন যখন আমার ইয়ে পেয়েছেন লেকচার নোট তো ওইটা মাথায় রেখে বেশি সময় আমরা দিব না আজকে থিঙ্কিং এর জন্য আপনারা টেন ফিফটিন সেকেন্ডস নেন তারপরে যে কোনো একজন বলেন উশ্রী আপনি একটু কাইন্ডলি ওই মাইক্রোফোনটা স্পিকার যিনি ওনারটা একটু আনমিউট করে দিয়েন থ্যাংক ইউ um so students um those who want to raise uh, any queries or questions as <coughs> i mentioned uh, you can write in on on the comment box or you can raise your you know you know how to raise a question in the zoom meeting okay so you, you are getting 15 seconds to prepare your question volunteer dorkar amader ডিসপ্লেসমেন্ট ইস when a group of people or people of a certain uh, region is forced to leave or uh, his or her house his or house country or place of origin or the place they grew up with for certain reasons either uh, it's a natural disaster or uh, they're forced to leave their society or the place they have been with uh, due to some external forces it could be war it could be um, disasters of some kind it could be the inability to have a proper life that they wanted to uh, because they have a vision for themselves so these are displacement in general when people are people are tending to move away from their uh, origin of country or the place they were born in and they tend to go away for a better life in their perspective this is a, a very general concept of displacement for from me thank you sir apna prashna ta what is your question oh, sir yeah so sir my question about displacement is we we all know that this is the main reason for displacement but rather we see that uh, when uh, the process is now very getting tiresome so my question is sir why do we see displacement as a negative impact where there is a lot of uh, citizens who from who are like they are like getting the brains like the proper like the most uh, i would say the mo- the most people who go to the other countries for a better life they are mostly the best kind of students the best kind of people who offers the best opportunities but why is it seen with negatively where there are the uh, brains and minds of the respective countries when but they're going outside and doing something better for the other country but it seemed very negatively whereas they're trying their best to provide so that's why i see sir why is it seen very negatively i see so if i summarize your question basically what you are asking why there is a negative perception about migrants when they go to a new society from the host community great great question so hold on to this question i will uh, revisit the question at the end of the uh, lecture second question please anyone folks quickly nobody is volunteer <laughs> okay um uh if not um it's fine i mean uh if you are uncomfortable you don't have to but uh, uh typically i do start with questions because that is how i uh, i can generate discussions um so today uh, my plan is uh, basically run uh, uh in a couple of slides that i prepared uh, with the data and then i will open up for detailed uh, question and answer session but folks uh, please do take notes uh, as i speak 
because uh, you really have to take part in the end of the uh, or during our Q and A session because that is how you know we get to uh, clarify each other's concept and you can challenge my concept too. I mean that is uh, perfectly all right and I will be uh, excited if someone amongst you can challenge some of the ideas that I'm throwing out today. Okay, uh, so without further ado, let's uh, let me uh, start my uh, formal part of deliberation and before I do. Uh, it's a tradition in our country, here in um, uh, Canada in general, uh, but where I live in Manitoba, the name of the province, uh, we do treaty acknowledgement. Uh, so uh, let me very briefly say that uh, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute and I, um, Kausar Ahmed, we, uh, we uh, live in the uh, lands of, uh, original lands of Anishinaabe, Creole, Jikri, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homelands of Methi Nation. We acknowledge the mistakes uh, made in the past, and we look forward to working together in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So uh, dear, dear students, uh, once again, uh, it's a privilege speaking to you uh, from uh, Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, it's uh, around minus 21 outside. Uh, it's very cold out uh, still in the month of March, which is a little unusual for us. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I feel the warmth amongst you. Uh, there are so many of you. And uh, of course, your faculty members and Colonel Jahir, uh, they have, uh, uh, invited me and that is really uh, quite a quite a challenging task because uh, speaking to a large group of uh, people is really always uh, challenging. Uh, so I, I'm going to share my slide and uh, let me know if you can uh, see my slides properly. Otherwise uh, we can always... <clears throat> So can you uh, can you see my slides? Uh, Ushi Bulwa, if you, on behalf of everyone, if you can kindly confirm. Yes, sir. I think I, uh, we can see. Fantastic. Excellent. So the way I titled my talk uh, today is the saga of human displacement in the past couple of decades and lesson learned. There are two motivations while I designed this lecture for you folks. Uh, first is I'm not going back to 100 years or thousands of years of human history of displacement. As some of you uh, rightly pointed out, uh, so especially the uh, first question uh, thrown by uh, one of your uh, uh, colleagues, uh, students, uh, she was very right that displacement is possibly one of the enduring features of human beings over decades. There's nothing new about it. Human, and, and in my opening remarks, I will also talk about uh, this aspect from a historian point of view. So there is nothing new about human displacement. We are talking in, in, in 2022, today, 23 actually, that uh, this is happening and what we are doing as a global family of humans in order to learn uh, from the displacement. And here comes my uh, favorite take uh, on this. And uh, uh, as we delve into the uh, topic itself, uh, I'm reminded of the words of renowned historian and author Noah Hariri in his book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. I'm a big fan of Hariri anyways. Uh, I follow him everywhere. I read his books uh, many, many times. So in, in his first book, as I mentioned, uh, A Brief History of Humankind, Harari argues that human history has been marred by a series of migrations and displacements with Homo sapiens constantly on the move throughout the millennia. From the earliest days of our species existence, humans have traversed continents and oceans, encountering new environments and challenges along the way. One of the most important moments in the history of human displacement occurred roughly 200,000 years ago when Homo sapiens first emerged in East Africa, especially in what is now modern day Kenya. From there, our species began to migrate outwards, first across the African continent and then to other parts of the world. These migrations were driven by a variety of factors, including changes in climate, population pressures, and the desire for new resources and opportunity. Mind these last two words, opportunities and resources. And these are the driving factors of humans, those who moved. Over time, Homo sapiens populations became established in different regions, adapting to their environments and developing unique cultures and ways of life. Today, we see the legacy of these migrations in the 
incredible diversity of human populations across the globe, from the Inuit of the Arctic to the Maori of New Zealand. However, it's important to note that these migrations were not always voluntary or peaceful. In many cases, actually, they were marked by conflict, exploitation, and the forced displacement of mostly indigenous populations across the globe. As we explore the topic on displacement today, it's crucial to consider the complex and often difficult stories behind these movements and the ongoing impacts they have on our world today. Noah Hariri has spoken extensively about the enduring impacts of human displacement. And here I would like to uh, uh, give a little bit of uh, you know, uh, important aspects that historian Noah Hariri mentioned. And this is about some of the impacts of the, of the displacement, like cultural exchange, environmental impacts, social and economic inequality, conflict and war, technological innovation, and genetic diversity. These six aspects, especially uh, the Professor Noah Hariri, categorically mentioned that these are the outcome of migration or displacement. So these are just a few of the uh, many impacts that human displacement has had over the course of our history. As we continue to navigate an increasingly interconnected world, it's crucial to consider the ongoing impact of migration and displacement and to work towards creating more equitable and sustainable ways of living. So now, uh, Let's proceed with our slide. And this is the scope that I have in mind today when I uh, deliver this uh, concept of displacement. We'll talk about uh, some of the uh, definitional part of the terminologies that you might encounter in the studies of displacement. We'll talk about uh, causes of human displacement, both natural and climate and conflict. Then we'll talk about economic and human displacement. I'll show you some of the graphs and I have uh, uh, previously, I have uh, shared some of these uh, uh, resources with your professor, Rushi Burwa. So I'll use some of them today. And finally, we'll uh, devote our time in lesson land where we'll talk about just one or two international laws and conventions with regards to human, uh, humanitarian aid and assistance. So the big concept. And I'm, I'm a big fan of big concept because this is how uh, it, it gives us this stimulus of thinking. What is this big concept in our topic? So let me start by posing this question. Why it occurs and how to limit it? Well, you might argue that, sir, uh, why should we limit it? But Folks, remember, most of our activities on the humanitarian side and international law side, it is about protection of displaced people. But protection of displaced people is always not that easy because when they display, are displaced, they do take shelter in a new place, i.e. the host country or the community. And this is what is getting increasingly uh, difficult and complex within the past two decades where host communities are not very happy of hosting a huge displaced people. Two case studies, Syrian displacement occurred uh, since 2014 after the civil war in, uh, ensued in Syria and a large influx of Syrian uh, uh, refugees, I mean, they took shelter in Turkey, Jordan, and many in Europe. And of course, some in, uh, uh, in our country, Canada. Uh, in the case of Rohingya displacement, uh, we have uh, sheltered 950,000 initially, and I'm sure the camp population is nearly 1.1 million now, according to various uh, sources. Uh, and from our organization, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute, we are uh, deeply involved in Rohingya research. You can visit our website, www.crick.org, and you will find our uh, publications, uh, two of our books, and one is forthcoming. So we, we talk about Rohingya displacement quite in details. So this is why my first big question to you, so that you think, uh, you, you keep thinking about it uh, throughout the lecture, that why it occurs and how do we actually want to limit those movements or displacement? 
in this part, let's visit or revisit. I, I'm sure you have been taught. Uh, uh, today's my one is just uh, one in a uh, you know just one lecture, single lecture, and you will not uh, remember or memorize everything. But uh, just a brush up of our memories uh, with regards to some of the terminologies. Uh, often you will find uh, in, in the vocabulary of, of policy documents or uh, in the uh, seminars or symposia. So displacement in general, of course, the movement of persons uh, who have been forced or obliged to flee and uh, their homes or places of habitual residence. So this is the key actually. Uh, so human, uh, when, uh, and since birth, uh, everybody has their own places to live. So we have passed through this evolution of hunter gatherers to agroeconomy to the industrial. And then we are now uh, in a very advanced society where we all have our own places. And it goes back to 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia when the concept of nation states came into existence. And the enduring uh, ideas of nation state is you have a piece of land, you have a piece of symbol, i.e. the flag, then you have uh, normally a language, uh, a principal language that you identify with. So uh, from then onward, uh, what we have is that we have a particular piece of land where we were born and we uh, identify ourselves ethnically, politically, uh, geographically to that particular area. So this is why the concept or the, or the definition of displacement come because if you are out of the habitual residence, where you were born or where you are naturally uh, or legally uh, made citizens, then it is called displacement. And uh, this one, uh, this was uh, the definition was taken from guiding uh, principles on internal displacement uh, by UNHCR. So let's move on to the next, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, part of this definition because there are six guiding principles folks remember when you talk and think and write about displacement. Uh, so first is uh, uh, arbitrary in the following circumstances, what we call, because displacement is uh, sometimes not planned. Sometimes might be plan planned because we, when we talk about Rohingya displacement, we do attribute it to the Myanmar military and their military operations in Rakhine, uh, Aragon state, uh, but sometimes Displacement is arbitrary, uh, will be considered arbitrary if the following circumstances are met. For example, when it is based on policies of apartheid, ethnic cleansing, or similar practices, which is very much uh, uh, you know, relevant to the Rohingya cases, uh, even in the case of, uh, we'll discuss about Sudan and, and other places. In situations of armed conflict, in the case of uh, uh, the whole displacement of Sahrawi refugees in Western Sahara, where I was participating as a UN peacekeeper, this was only caused by the armed conflict uh, and aggression of Moroccan army. Uh, in cases of large scale development projects, which is very common in, in many places of the world, uh, think about the NMD, uh, Normoda uh, Valley in India. And uh, uh, some of you might be aware that uh, the famous uh, Booker Prize winner Oruntuti Roy actually uh, uh, worked extensively with the, uh, there's a movement in India at that time, it's called uh, Normoda Bacha Wandalon, uh, Save Normoda. So there's, uh, there's a whole saga of building dams for hydroelectricity. Uh, this is uh, always, you know, uh, state, uh, state's narrative is, is for the better of, betterment of the people of its citizen, i.e. development. And, and in my country, in Canada, is is very much uh, the same uh, we call it hydro project, uh, and in many of the hydro projects, the outcome is displacement of indigenous population uh, in the from the northern part of our province. And finally, in the case of disasters, of course, we do understand uh, a large scale natural disaster like earthquake and uh, cyclones uh, do cause uh, displacement. So these are the guiding principles, uh, folks. Just to remember when you talk about displacement. There's something called collective expulsion. Any measures compelling uh, non-nationals as a group to leave a country except where such a measure is taken on the basis of reasonable and objective examination of particular case of individual, individual or group. The case come to my mind is a Palestinian uh, case uh, since it is happening in 1948. Uh, if you see the maps of uh, West Bank and Gaza, 
uh, the whole territory from 1948. And if you use time lapse series, you will find how encroachment of uh, of the settlement of Palestinians uh, took place over the past four, five, six decades. And now uh, Palestinians are only uh, kind of living in the enclave of Gaza and uh, the, and the other side, Ramallah. So uh, this is what is uh, meant uh, when they talk about collective expulsion. This is also displacement. Then you have climate migration. I do not do uh, read it out, but uh, in general, as you understand that uh, movement of persons, if it occurs due to climate and climate migration, uh, and, and is, is of course large scale. And for example, the drought even uh, drought in Sudan has caused a uh, uh, lot of displacement and internal movement of people, as we all know. And of course, uh, uh, there are uh, much of the you know many of the floods and uh, some of the issues of continuous climate change in some of the parts of the world cause human displacement. Emigration. Um, so I intentionally wanted to talk about this terminology because often we we think that uh, if something bad happens to us, then we migrate. But in many cases, think about our country of Bangladesh, thousands and thousands of Bangladeshis do live abroad. Uh, a large group live uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Middle East, they earn, they work, uh, and for us, those who work uh, and uh, stay uh, in, 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 a, in a place uh, like Canada and elsewhere. So we have come voluntarily. So nobody forced us to come. And we have chosen this path of migration and we, we, we have come for various personal reasons. So this is what is also a part of displacement because uh, whether it is intentional, uh, but it happened, uh, we no longer live in the place where we are born. So also remember that uh, this is one of the phenomenon of displacement. Humanitarian admission. So next couple of uh, uh, terminologies I have uh, sort of thought of uh, bringing uh, up for the discussion because we need to understand the roles of international community in supporting displaced people. So humanitarian admission is a term used uh, uh, in, the, in the legal uh, uh, you know, uh, languages because uh, it is something the second or third country, what we call, they voluntarily accept displaced people. And here it is something uh, that we always try to remember, uh, remind the host community that uh, there are international covenants like non refoulement uh, according to 1951 convention and pathways for migrants uh, to become uh, you know, permanent and avoid vulnerable situations. These are important, but essentially humanitarian admission uh, can be used for person in need for protection, especially political asylum that we frequently see in Europe and North America. And uh, those who are, uh, you know, people, those who are in vulnerable situations, like uh, in the case of Afghanistan, you might, uh, might know as well that uh, in Canada, uh, we are admitting a large number of Afghanistan, Afghani people and their families, those who worked to support our forces, uh, uh, Canadian Armed Forces in Afghanistan as an interpreter or, you know, in various, Officers and because we feel obliged that we must uh, protect them because the situation changed in Afghanistan. So we have opened up our uh, doors here in Canada and we admit large number of Afghanistan people. And uh, it is needless to say, you all are aware of Ukraine and an Ukrainian displacement. And we have admitted, uh, I think it's over 100,000 now Ukrainians uh, to Canada uh, over the past one year. So these are the humanitarian admission and Canada has a particular program for the Ukrainians uh, to fast track their movement uh, here in Canada. So uh, in many ways, uh, this is what uh, we call humanitarian admission. IDP, internally displaced person is another terminology, um, person or group who have been forced, obliged or free to leave their homes, uh, but uh, they do not cross the national border or recognize state. So they are internally displaced. And in many cases, you will find uh, in Thailand, in uh, of course, in the case of Rohingyas, people have been displaced from one place to other and uh, relocated. Uh, but one thing I would like to share with you, um, I was speaking with some of the Chinese uh, professors, those who uh, I, I encountered them in 2019 in Vancouver, 
uh, we are talking in an international seminar uh, in UBC. So uh, two of these professors actually uh, work, uh, I forgot the name of the province, but now what they told me that um, uh, they were working uh, in the field uh, which in China is, uh, is titled uh, resettlement. So I was curious what resettlement China is talking about. So they were saying that uh, in the past uh, couple of decades, China has built numerous dams, uh, similar to case of India, but it was sponsored by uh, state, uh, unlike the Indian case, because Indian case, these are uh, MNCs, multinational corporations. So here, uh, the Chinese state has decided that it will be developed here. So the whole village, uh, let's say 100 or 200,000 people, they have rehabilitated and resettled this 100,000 people, for example, uh, to a whole new area. And they have literally plugged them out and planted them in, in a different place. So uh, whether we should call it IDP, uh, it, it is up to you folks to think and judge yourself, but it's a phenomenal case. I have uh, I learned at this point in time that this is also uh, you know, caused in the name of development. And I think we are uh, at the end. Resettlement, um, according to International Office of Migration, is the transfer of refugees from the country in which they have sought protection to another state and uh, with the permanent resident status. Resettlement is a very uh, well-known terminology used in Canada and elsewhere. And you will find uh, uh, you know, thousands and thousands are uh, rehabilitated and resettled in uh, with full uh, residency status uh, uh, in, in European countries, UK uh, and North America as well. And I think this is the final term, climate refugee. Uh, do not undermine the term. It is the uh, very new lexicon uh, term that we see uh, is going to stay with us because climate uh, change is real. It is happening and it is going to cause uh, the rise of the sea level in many of the uh, you know, countries, especially Maldives and some part of uh, our uh, Bangladesh as well. So uh, in, the, in the near future, we are going to see that people are being displaced just because of climate change. So <clears throat> these are all our definitional part uh, we are done. So in the definitional part, do you folks have any questions for me? Do you agree or disagree with the definitions that I have shown or shared in last couple of a couple of slides? Because these are all, all taken from UNHCR or IUM or, or just two papers of two of the scholars that I studied. So, any questions and uh, you know uh, argument about the definitions? Do you have any definitions of your own? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum uh, salam. Ji, sir, I don't have the problem with definitions, but I have some questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, ji, sir, abolishing the displacement usually human-made or a forced uh, migration is done. Hoye thake. Jodi ami just particularly particularly bully, je armed conflict is done. Jodi displacement hoye thake. Ah, uh, for example, for a uh, state. তাহলে কেন তাদের এই যে বেসিক নিডস গুলো সেগুলো ফুলফিল করা হয় না ওয়েল আই থিং ইটস ইটস এ গুড কোশ্চেন ইফ আই हैव हैव योर नेम আর ইউ সাংমা থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ সাংমা জি জি স্যার জি ওকে ফ্যান্টাস্টিক সাংমা আই উইল অ্যাকচুয়ালি গো ব্যাক টু ইয়োর কোশ্চেনস এট দ্য এন্ড অফ দি উইক বিকজ ইউ হ্যাভ পোজড এ কোশ্চেন নট পার্টিকুলারলি টু দি ডেফিনিশনস রাদার হোয়াই দি ট্রিটমেন্ট অফ a displaced person due to armed conflict uh, is not taken seriously. Possibly that is what you are saying because uh, they are displaced not because of their fault or their choice. Uh, they were forced to displace. So uh, hold on and hang on. We'll revisit your question at the end. Ushi, uh, if you kindly remind me, uh, I will uh, like to answer her question at the end of the session. Okay, yes. folks, uh, without uh, uh, further delay, let's uh, talk about statistics. As you see in my screen here, I don't want to bore you with the numbers, but just to just to give you some perspective, what you're talking about. Uh, it is taken from I IFRC, International uh, Red Cross and uh, Red Crescent Society, uh, which uh, takes account of the numbers. Uh, so more than 280 million international migrants, 280 million, look at the number. Uh, 
almost 90 million forcibly displaced. 24 million people displaced by disasters every year. Sheer number of people, those who are out of home, out of their natural habitat, and in need of basic human needs. Look at this huge, huge number. So just keep in mind that the number itself is increasing each day. Uh, second data from IOM, uh, International Office of Migration, when they are talking about international migrations in 2020 to 81 million, percentage of migration in the global population, 3.6% of total 6.7 billion people. And uh, I'm not talking about remittance, so these different things, because uh, as I said, uh, uh, there are uh, migration of choice, but migrant workers are also 164 million uh, worldwide. And when we talk about displacement by choice, uh, we talk about migrants and their rights as well. But just imagine 3.6% of global uh, you know, human family, uh, they are actually displaced and sometimes homeless and facing all other uh, you know, challenges. Folks, I want you to give me the list of five major displacement that you think occurred in the past two decades. Give me one, one name that you think. Uh, sir, uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, well, the displacement of uh, Syrian uh, refugees. Fantastic. And do you have uh, further names in your, in your mind? Uh, sir, I, about what about uh, Yemeni refugees, like due case to the right. right cases of displacement. So, if Syrian refugee is a case a, agreed, and what else? So, Rohingya, uh, Rohingya is one case, okay. And yeah, rule, I mean, go ahead. Is it rule, I mean, you wanted to say something? No, no, sir, that's it. Okay, um, so um, I was trying to, uh, when I was preparing the lecture today, uh, I was trying to find out that uh, what would be the uh, you know, five most, uh, in numbers, of course, the largest displacement. So folks, here is the list. Of course, top is Syrian refugee crisis, 5.6 million, uh, those who fled uh, to neighboring countries, and of course, uh, to Europe and Americas. Venezuelan refugee crisis in Latin America is the second in terms of number, 5.5 million. And we don't uh, hear much in the news because it is Venezuela, is, is far away, and uh, most of them uh, actually uh, either cross to North, to Mexico and up to Americas, or uh, you know stayed within the Latin American continent. But then you have Afghan refugee crisis, 2.9 million. And you have South Sudanese refugee crisis when Sudan was divided, split into two in 2003 through the UN uh, organization. Now you have North and South Sudan. This also uh, saw a displacement of 2.2 million people. And finally, of course, close to 1 million is uh, our own Rohingya crisis. And many of you are aware that uh, this is uh, what we are also hosting about as, uh, from Bangladesh side. Uh, the huge number, and I'm sure the number is much uh, larger now. So these are the just five cases of largest displacement within the past uh, couple of uh, decades. So as I uh, wrap up my first part of the discussion, the causes of displacement, by now we have spoken enough about two major causes. One is, of course, natural disasters, climate change, and conflict. So here is the interplay of the cause of displacement. In both the cases, see, humans are responsible. As one of the students uh, initially asked me the question that why migration is taken negatively or perceived negatively because those who have uh, migrated or displaced, they had no option. And this is why now think and put on a hat uh, from the perspective of an aggressor or oppressor. So it is again the human, right? So human beings orchestrate armed conflict and they oppress others, other ethnic groups or in you know, a political groups. 
and therefore the displacement occurs. And in the case of climate change, you might say that, sir, it is not in our hand, but are you sure? Because human beings are also causing natural, uh, you know, climate change. We all know about the, uh, you know, uh, famous uh, icon in terms of uh, climate change uh, protest, Greta Thunberg, and she was in our city as well. Uh, she came here and uh, led a protest in Canada a couple of years ago. So uh, the idea is that these are also caused by humans. Think about the carbon emission. Think about the, uh, you know, massive deforestation. Uh, and also the uh, you know uh, digging out uh, you know in the in the earth and you know uh, in the mining uh, you know things that I'm referring to. So these are also caused by the human being. So essentially, what I want to convey through this slide is that we humans are actually responsible for a large scale of displacement over decades. We cannot absolve ourselves from the responsibility that well, we are not responsible for climate change or so and so forth. So next we have, <clears throat> uh, I have uh, shared with you folks, uh, the uh, Barclays, uh, Barclays has done a phenomenal job in terms of infographic. And uh, the, I mean, I will only touch briefly because you know, you're good enough to study at your own and uh, dig deeper into the data if you are interested. But for the sake of the class, uh, I would only uh, show you that in this infographic, three things are important. As Berkeley prepared this data set, uh, they talked about causes of global change, which is actually impacting displacement or causing displacement in turn, how the earth system works and the measurable changes. So these three dimensions are really fascinating and important uh, in the studies of displacement. So let's uh, see if the slide is uh, what you call, um, yeah, so this is working. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, so this is a huge, uh, you know, infographic. So we, we let's not uh, talk about much, but just imagine in the, in the outer circle, they spoke about causes of global change here, human causes uh, and the, uh, in the, both the sides and they have listed a number of them. For, from example, uh, for example, urbanization, habitat restorations, then invasive species, and so and so forth. So in this outer circle, uh, you will find all the causes that Berkeley uh, and, their, uh, and their scientists have come out with. And second uh, inner circle, uh, they are talking about how the earth system works. And the reason they are talking about earth system because earth is only one piece and where we all live. And this is why we have to be really cautious what is happening in terms of uh, displacement and destruction from our end. And uh, of course you have the ecosystem and others. And in terms of uh, measurable changes, uh, this is really uh, interesting because you can see in their uh, data set that they are talking about a number of uh, you know, variables that they used, for example, displacement, uh, of human population. And if you click these things, uh, you will, uh, they will uh, lead you to another uh, very detailed you know, description. So uh, I'm just letting you know that this resource is available. And if you are interested, if your professor Ushiburu is interested, uh, you can spend a couple of hours <coughs> in the future class to go into these details of these activities of, uh, of the data set, which is really, really fascinating. Um, so, Good. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> there's another resource that I wanted to share with you today uh, is from Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. Uh, it's a very renowned uh, group. Uh, it's hosted by Norwegian Refugee Council, Council NRG, and it's very updated uh, uh, April 22. Uh, that was the last they updated. And it is again a huge uh, resource if you folks are interested. And what I was particularly fascinated by uh, by the report that is uh, up. I think it is, uh, uh, you can download the whole report uh, in PDF form. And here they have shown number of statistics and data, uh, why the displacement happens, what are the uh, causes, what are the agents and what eventually happens with the displaced people. So uh, feel free to consult this uh, site as well. Here um, we are going to talk uh, 
again, very briefly for the sake of time, uh, effects of human displacement. So folks remember displaced people, when they are displaced from a particular area, they travel X amount of distance and go and resettle in some other area. So they don't necessarily in today's world go and settle in mountains or desert or sea. They all go and resettle in a place where other peoples are living for you know, decades or centuries. So it is basically thinking this way that a group of people have been you know, uh, kind of relocated uh, to a place where already there are people. So this is why in terms of displacement, you think of two communities, the host community and the guest community. So both host and guest have their own responsibilities and their dynamics is important to understand. Think about the case of Rohingyas when in 2017, 25th of August, they started coming in in large number. I mean, the largest possible number <coughs> in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh and so many people, uh, I, have, I have seen it in the news. I have friends in Bangladesh. I know that people have gone uh, out of their ways uh, and extended their uh, you know, solidarity and help and fed literally thousands of people for months together. It was all about explaining and expressing uh, their, uh, you know, camaraderie and friendship that uh, they feel for the uh, Rohingyas, those who are also human beings. But uh, fast forward uh, from 2018 uh, to 2022, can you really say that uh, Bangladesh and people, especially on the southern side in Chittagong and in these areas, where they are uh, hosted, do you think still that level of uh, friendship and love still exist? I doubt uh, because of my own research. I, I seriously doubt that that level of uh, you know uh, tolerance and uh, patience uh, possibly is not there. So this is why it is also important, folks, to understand in the concept of displacement that host community which has for voluntarily or involuntarily uh, subscribed to you know welcome the guest there might be issues that needs to be taken into consideration so i think uh, i will resort to a very short two minutes video here and again you can uh, watch it yourself but Sorry, there is an ad. Just bear with me. Internal displacement affects not only displaced people, but also the economy. IDPs often have to move away from where they work, losing their income. IDMC estimates this loss of income and what it would cost to meet the security, housing, health, and education needs of IDPs. For 2020, we estimated the economic impact of displacement worldwide at nearly 20.5 billion US dollars. That's enough to buy around 1 billion doses of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccine at current US prices. But our figures don't even account for longer term consequences or impacts on host communities. In large protracted crises, the economy of a whole country can suffer. In Somalia, the economic impact of internal displacement amounts to over 20% of GDP. Governments and aid providers, as well as IDPs themselves and host communities, bear the brunt of this economic burden. So, uh, folks, uh, this is what uh, is important to understand that the host community suffers from economic issues, social and political and what I uh, also intended uh, to, uh, just a second. Uh, okay, sorry, um, the YouTube was on. Uh, what I was uh, talking about that, uh, the displacement, what we have seen here uh, is also <coughs> uh, occurring. Can you see my slide again? No? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Oh, it went off back again. Okay, so here we were, and uh, I just mentioned one last point in this slide in terms of impact psychosocial. So when refugees and displaced people come into host community, uh, not only they bring their own psychosocial conditions, but they also impact the host community. 
thing about uh, Rohingyas in Bangladesh, because you will understand better uh, than the other case studies. So when the Rohingyas come and they you know, kind of settle uh, in, in, uh, in the ho within the host community, uh, there are many issues uh, come with regards to security, with regards to law and, uh, law and uh, order situation, with regards to local economy, and et cetera. And psychosocially, uh, the displaced persons are kind of, they suffer from a lot of trauma because in the, in, in the beginning, uh, this is what has occurred to their life. So they bring this trauma to the host community as well. And this is why uh, we need to understand that what they have gone through. Uh, displacement disrupts IDP and host communities, housing condition, health, security, livelihood, and education. And, and this highlighted portion, I would like you to remember from our today's class that repercussions are expected. Remember about the earthquake in Nepal and the Mexico earthquake and Hurricane uh, Ike in Cuba. There are so much of you know, expenses uh, or, the, or the money lost but also remember there are negative repercussions because the economy is at stake. The displaced persons being hosted uh, adds a lot of burden to the host country's economy. And therefore there are expected you know, negative impressions and repercussions always uh, happen due to displacement. So um, these are the seven major impacts due to displacement. And this is taken, sources given in the slides, if you want to study further, but I'll just uh, touch up on the titles, livelihoods, jobs. Remember thousands and thousands of people come in into the new you know, host community and they also need livelihood because they have to earn, uh, they have to earn their livelihood, they have to spend their money uh, to earn uh, breads and, and to their families. So. There are enormous challenges uh, starts occurring when the pressure on the economy falls in. <clears throat> the health, because in the host community or in the resettled community in a third country, so because we are not talking about only IDPs, we are also talking about uh, forced displacement like Syrian refugees when they migrated to Europe and other places. So uh, they also need to be taken care of uh, by providing them uh, proper health services. Now imagine if a small country uh, uh, you know, like Jordan, where thousands of Syrians and Palestinians live, how can Jordan uh, sustain and provide equal healthcare to all these people? It is simply not possible. Education, uh, enormously speaking, education is the most important factor that displaced people suffer from. And we are talking about generations of undereducated and no education of the displaced people. Uh, from my organization, we are deeply involved in educating Rohingya females in the camps, both in Ukhya Teknaf in Bashanchor. And what we are doing actually, uh, we are uh, educating with whatever resources we have, of course, uh, so that uh, they have future. And uh, education is, as I said, a single uh, most impact that all the displaced uh, persons face. Environment wise, again, I'll go back to Rohingya case because if you look at the joint response plans, and other environmental reports, you will find the uh, devastation of the environment that has been caused because of uh, displacement and displaced people. Housing and infrastructure, it is self-explanatory, I believe, because the need exceeded the uh, you know, demand. And there is a huge need of you know, shelters, houses, where these displaced people to be uh, you know, uh, put, uh, and of course, security, law enforcement, uh, drug-related uh, things, and uh, other uh, you know, trafficking happens because of displaced people uh, when they come into a society. And of course, social and cultural life, uh, these are really complex, uh, complex dimensions and complex discussions, uh, which some of you might uh, uh, understand that uh, when uh, new people come into a society uh, uh, in, a, in a different place, uh, they both imp get impacted because they don't belong to the similar culture, but also they impact the local community uh, and impacting their local culture as well. I, I don't want you to go out of this lecture without looking into this aspect, war on terror. Folks, extraordinary phenomena in this century, uh, in this uh, century, of course, 9-11 uh, and uh, onward, we have displaced people, and look at the number of this slide. And I've taken it from Statista, 
one of the uh, good website that uh, provides uh, good statistics. From Iraq, 9.2 million to Libya, 1.2 million. These are all millions, folks, all millions. And uh, I think some of you have asked that uh, oh, this displacement occurred uh, not because of the people of Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan. It happened because of us, because we intervened militarily in the name of uh, whatever you can say, you know, uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, etc. But war and terror also displaced 37 million people worldwide. Global trends, again, a beautiful uh, infographics. Uh, it gives you an idea from 2011 to 2020. Uh, if you mark here, and what I see that uh, people living in internal displaced due to conflict and violence uh, is is actually maximum in 2020. Look at this graph, it starts from zero, it went nearly to 50%. So this is the largest group of people displaced due to internal issues. And refugees under UN uh, Refugee Agency uh, is the uh, next, uh, is the smaller group actually, as you see, these are smaller portion here always. And the large por portion is refugee under UNHCR mandate because UNHCR has their own definition of refugee and according to their one. And what they say is that refugees, uh, I mean, if they're expelled from their own place, then only they will be entitled as a refugee because uh, you might be aware that in the case of Rohingyas, uh, the Bangladesh government, uh, uh, it doesn't use the word for the uh, people, those who came after 2017 as refugee, uh, rather uh, the government of Bangladesh uses the word uh, or the phrase internally displaced um, Myanmar nationals, IDMN. So here is this a uh, little bit of def definitional issues because uh, according to my understanding, UNHCR actually uh, terms everyone as refugee, those who came from Myanmar, but host country Bangladesh doesn't. So uh, according to UNHCR's mandate, uh, here's the statistics. And of course you see asylum seekers are very small in numbers. Uh, this green, uh, you know, uh, portion of the slide, uh, the graphs. So this is a very small per uh, percentage. But interestingly, you see, from 2011 to 2020, the past decade, uh, everything has has been, uh, you know, incremental increasing. All situations in all four categories have increased. So we are actually uh, seeing the huge trend of displaced people. Uh, due to various reasons, you know, we have talked about the causes. So uh, it is it is increasing. Uh, actually, the only uh, uh, thing is, uh, you know, the uh, political asylum things. Uh, in 2011, what we see is a very tiny number, uh, but in 2020, uh, you see it has increased to to certain extent. So uh, to summarize here is that we see a very upward tick in numbers with regards to displacement uh, in the past decade. Last part of our lecture, uh, we'll, we'll very briefly, it's a crowded slide, uh, but I, I would share this slide, uh, of course, with your Professor Rushi. So uh, after the lecture, I'll send you up a PDF format. You can always keep it uh, for your reference. Let's talk about 1951 United Nations conventions relating to the status of refugees and 1967 protocol. Uh, it's called Rome Statute. So here is the definition, remember, here is the definition of UNHCR, which sometimes contradicts host country's definition. According to 1951 uh, convention and additional protocol of 67, the refugees are person who flee their country due to well-founded fear. Remember, this is the catch word, well-founded fear of persecution due to race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. So these are all factors, political opinion, membership of a particular group. Let me tell you a quick uh, case uh, here. Are you aware of a uh, Chinese uh, group? Uh, they are not faith groups, but they practice something which, which is called Falun Gong. So Falun Gong is a dissident according to Chinese government a dissident group of people, those who just practice you know, similar thing like Tai Chi, uh, but they, they say that it's a way of life, etc. So Chinese government heavily persecute Falun Gongs. Uh, 
And in, in here, we have a uh, lot of people sought uh, refugee status because they are fearful, uh, and uh, which is really justified. Uh, and uh, they come and seek political asylum here. So Falun Gong is one group uh, that quickly comes to my mind. And political asylum, as you know, it is rampant and you can come and you know, file your case. But in, in our country, in Canada, uh, we have a court, we call it a refugee court. So in refugee court, your case will be heard by a judge and he will decide whether you should deserve political asylum. So a um, couple of last points that UNHCR includes individuals recognized under the 51 convention relating to status of refugees and 67 protocol and 1969 OAU's convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa. So in 1969, Organization African Unity has also come out with a definition, which are both important in understanding the refugee law. And in terms of settlement, uh, what we have, there is no law. It is individual countries, you know, uh, willingness to get people in their country. However, UNHCR uh, says that it submitted 39,500 refugee applications for resettlement. And according to their statistics, only 34,400 people were resettled to 21 countries. This is just one third of the number resettled in 2019, 2018, and so on and so forth. So it is decreasing. Uh, countries like uh, you know Western nations, mostly Europeans and North Americans, they are not willing to take people, uh, those who are uh, displaced. There are many uh, political and social economic reasons. I'm not going to go there, but just to give you in perspective, Canada is a very you know kind of open country. It accepts refugees from all over the world. And uh, we have taken Yazidis uh, recently, Syrians, Ukrainians, as you all know. But it's, it's really um, interesting that Canada only accepted uh, only a handful of Rohingyas in 2008 and 9. And after that, Canada officially has not accepted any Rohingyas for resettlement. Uh, anyway, uh, there is an ongoing discussion to convince Canadian government to accept some Rohingyas. Folks, uh, I'm at the end of my discussion, uh, and I just wanted to very, um, it's a sober rem reminder to all of us uh, that uh, we, we are a global human family, and maybe we are different in our skin color and tone, but we all have these inherent human rights to be treated with dignity, equality, and rights. Look at this number of people, those who every day, um, and I lived in uh, that area for some time, Morocco and that area. I, am, I, I have witnessed, I have seen, and being here in Canada with my research, uh, I, have, I know that thousands of people as we speak are crossing uh, the perilous uh, you know, uh, part of Gibraltar Mediterranean uh, from Africa and trying to reach to Greek islands and Spain. But uh, there are so many reasons and we cannot blame them either because there are well-founded fear in their home countries. But this is what is happening and this is what is reality. Now it is up to us how we really treat uh, the people that we have. So before we um, take questions, I think, uh, yeah, I will open up for the questions now uh, before we go into uh, my last part of uh, you know uh, closing remarks, Uchi Burwa. So uh, floor is open. If uh, if your students are willing to spend some more time with us uh, and uh, challenging me, my concepts, my data, feel free. Welcome. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your uh, thought provoking and very insightful lecture. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank you for giving this wonderful lecture uh, out of your busy schedule. And uh, now I'd like to request my students uh, to raise their questions uh, or if they have any queries or opinions. Uh, guys, you can write it on the comment box. And also, you can raise your hands. Um, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, okay, maybe we are getting some questions. Yes, yes. Uh, we have already 
I received two questions. Yes, uh, correct, correct. Maybe I, I can ask them to uh, ask the question directly from you, sir. Yeah, that will be fantastic. Point. Sangma, uh, thanks to Sangma has written, if displacement occurs as a result of armed conflict, why are they fundamental needs? She has already spoken in the past. So let, let me um, respond to this. So um, yes, you are very right that if the displacement occurred, uh, without any choice, then who's responsible for these displaced persons' basic human needs, i.e. food, shelter, health, education, and etc. Interestingly, in international law, there is no solution asking XYZ countries to take responsibility. It is absolutely in the purview of the host country whether to you know, provide them in terms of basic human needs or something else. However, for, since the foundation of United Nations, UNHCR and other organizations, an appeal has been always made in the past to raise money, fund, and channeling these funds to the host country so that they can provide basic human needs. For example, for the Rohingya cases, what we are doing, Bangladesh receives funds from various organizations, including UN and individually countries like Canada. Uh, Canada has uh, so far given nearly $6 million since 2017, just for your information. Um, so this money are given to host country uh, with the hope, with the expectation that host country will provide the basic human needs uh, for the displaced persons, especially uh, for the armed conflict. But uh, essentially, there is no enforceable law or obligation internationally that you can hold a nation state or the host country uh, you know, responsible for not providing anything. And it goes back to these uh, uh, you know, laws of refoulement because always UNHCR and other international human rights organization remind the host country that uh, do not uh, refoul this. Uh, refoulement means uh, the host country, if it takes some measures so that uh, you know, displaced person taking shelter uh, becomes helpless and uh, you know would like to uh, return to their home place. So these coercive measures are called refoulement. So technically, in the international regime, we do not have any enforceable law to hold the host country responsible. Naushin, if if not, um, do you want to do you want to um, uh, uh, tell your questions, or you want me to read it out? And Naushin, you can ask your question. Sir, my question to you is, uh, can the presence of displaced people pose a threat to a national security or stability? What's your personal opinion on this? Oh, of course. Um, this is, again, a very interesting question. I would uh, really appreciate, uh, Naushin, for thinking from the security perspective. Remember, folks, host country or community has always their level of expectations, right? And it has already um, set rules in terms of its security, uh, uh, especially, you know, we talk about local security than regional and international. And when large group of people do enter and leave indefinitely, there has to be some issues with regards to, uh, you know, security uh, in all these three tiers. You must think locally, then regionally and then internationally. Two case studies, one Rohingya, one in Dabab refugee camp where the Somali and Kenyan refugees stay. So Al-Shabaab, the terror group, which operates in uh, those areas, Somalia, Kenya. Uh, so most of the Al-Shabaab fighters actually come from Dabab refugee camp, most according to some of the studies. And they are recruited uh, for their, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, terror uh, activities, and uh, it is also easy, right? And this is why Somalia and Kenya, both countries, are very much, uh, you know, uh, kind of they are very, they have very strong opinion about running the uh, one of the largest uh, refugee camps uh, in in Africa. In the cases of Rohingyas, I, I think most of you know, if you browse uh, local uh, you know, website newspapers, uh, you will have a bigger idea that how uh, gradually, gradually, it didn't happen in 1718, but over the years, how the security situation is deteriorating in the camps, internal uh, factions you know, fighting between the groups uh, amongst themselves, 
then you have drug trafficking uh, from the Golden Triangle. Then you have the international dimension of uh, various extremist group recruiting people from the group. Uh, folks, remember, uh, in the case of Rohingyas, uh, there are a large segment of young people sitting in the camps doing nothing every day. So if you do not engage young people, uh, think about yourself uh, that what they have to do. I know they are really susceptible to recruitment by any extremist group outside the world. So at the end, I would say yes. And the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, she has mentioned about the security threat in the UN General Assembly, I think uh, back to back three times now. So if you even browse uh, the government of Bangladesh website, you'll find her speech in the UN General Assembly. And uh, all three times she really reminded the international community that if the Rohingya crisis is not resolved, then we are talking about uh, regional insecurity. So yes, uh, it creates a lot of insecurity in the host community. So, Mohammed Sami, you wanted to ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am, I had a question, but uh, I already got the answer. <laughs> like I, had, I had a question on Rohingya crisis. And uh, the question was like, how uh, Rohingya crisis can put uh, traditional security threat for Bangladesh, like border security, terrorism, crime and murder by ARSA, also by other potential terrorist group. So, uh, yeah. so Mr. Sami, I will strongly advise to buy one of our books from Amazon, if you want. Uh, we have written a whole chapter, two, three chapters on security. And our forthcoming book, uh, which is jointly published uh, uh, I mean, uh, we have the uh, manuscript, uh, some part of it from Peace and Conflict Studies Department of Dhaka University and us. So we are writing on security threats uh, to country. And uh, uh, I'll just, uh, we'll, I, yeah, I have responded. So I'll just add one quick uh, uh, comment here is that uh, security, um, national security is the, is the way a state believes its integrity, its sovereignty, uh, uh, are at stake or are in jeopardy. So it is totally dependent on the, on the nature of the state's thinking with regards to security. So there is no D format or standard format uh, that will be applicable here and there. It, it goes all around. Uh, each country has their own definition of national security. But uh, with regards to Rohingya case, I, I have my personal opinion, which I have spoken many a times and I've written extensively, I still write, uh, is that the repatriation or in whatever way we think Rohingyas are going back to their uh, places of uh, you know, home or their homes in Rakhine state, that should uh, happen rather quickly because the more they stay, the more they will become uh, restless. They, they will become frustrated. They're already frustrated, right? And the enormous grievances that they have because they were persecuted, many of them were killed, they don't have any future because in Bangladesh, definitely they don't have any future. We even don't yes, want uh, in Bangladesh them to be integrated in our you know, society at all. So uh, for this kind of population, it, see, it is not their fault either, right? I mean, nobody, none of the Rohingyas have come voluntarily to Bangladesh. They were forced, they were evicted from their places. So they didn't have any choice. Uh, but now they are, uh, they are a victim of our whole, you know, these circumstances. And uh, we all, international community and host community, you have to really think hard uh, in terms of uh, the risk uh, posed by displacement of Rohingyas. Mr. Amin, go ahead. Okay, uh, now, uh, Rasif, you, ha you have a question, right? You wrote it on the common box. Would you like to ask it directly or it's okay? Uh, I would like to ask it directly anyway. So uh, my question was that, uh, sir, you told, uh, you asked, you just uh, informed us a minute ago that there are uh, no obligations regarding refugees and their migration. So if there aren't any obligations regarding these matters, like uh, where these refugees will migrate, then doesn't it uh, automatically become a global south phenomenon? Because uh, they will obviously deny the fact that they won't uh, take refugees into their custody because it's not their obligation. <clears throat> In fact, uh, uh, Mr. Nasif, that is the case. See, uh, you know, when 
any conflict occur, uh, either is armed conflict like the case of Rohingyas or Syria or the natural disaster, for example, the drought in Sudan. So people move because they want to leave. They don't want to die, right? But when they embark into a place, i.e. the host country, it is absolutely host country's you know, uh, jurisdiction whether to treat them well, whether to feed them well, whether to educate the children, etc. It is absolutely their purview, the way they do. Well, we do have 1951 Refugee Convention and the additional Rome Statute 1967 Protocol, which outlines the responsibility only. But if the nation state doesn't want to you know, do the responsibility, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, Bangladesh is not signatory to 1951 and 67 uh, both. So if you are not signatory, nobody can even rebuke you. I mean, uh, what happens in the international system, you will be uh, uh, shamed in the General Assembly or you know, in the media or somewhere that you are not taking care of the refugees uh, who have sought uh, refuge in your country. So shame on you, something like that, right? But in the case of Bangladesh and other many countries, those who are not signatory to 1951 convention, even you cannot shame them because they have not, right from the beginning, have accepted any responsibility of housing uh, you know, a displaced person. So at the end, it is absolutely host country's purview and uh, their willingness to support the displaced person. On uh, I think Afsana Rahman, uh, Afsana Rahman has a very uh, excellent question. Maybe she's asking out of the like the security box. box like, yeah. yeah, the 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 perspective may uh, is uh, can would you like to ask it directly, Afsana? Maybe yes, sure, ma'am. I can ask sir directly. So, sir, my question is: Can climate refugees claim as the same rights as other refugees? Because it is widely believed that this type of displacement is accidental rather than forced because of any war or conflict. So, do they get the same rights as the refugees that are displaced due to war and conflict? According to 1951 Refugee Convention, they are. They are entitled with the full rights of any displaced person uh, seeking refuge in a third country uh, because of war and uh, other reasons, armed conflict and etc. Uh, however, in practice, uh, we see a lot of uh, struggle in uh, sheltering uh, climate refugees. Because, for example, if you come here in Canada and say that, sir, I am displaced, because uh, there was an earthquake, for example, in the case of Nepal, uh, there was a serious earthquake, half of the uh, you know, city was destroyed and all these things. But uh, in, in all practicality, it is really difficult to convince a uh, refugee board uh, chair or, uh, or, the, or the judge here in Canada that this is the case you are really asking a uh, refugee. Uh, there are practical reasons too, because when a decision is made to offer you the uh, permanent residency uh, in, in Canada uh, due to you know, displacement, uh, they go back to this uh, probability of returning uh, or going back to your original situation. So if there is any probability and possibility still uh, holds good, so they are not going to uh, possibly allow you to stay here in Canada. So this, this is the practical side of it. But according to the convention, yes, 100%, climate refugees are also entitled because they have lost their habitat, because they lost their living conditions uh, due to uh, you know, uh, climate action. And as we speak, uh, actually, um, Ms. Tasmima Rahim, uh, let me uh, uh, tell you that uh, uh, this is an ongoing discussion in, our, in, in Western world, how to frame climate refugees so that uh, they get full legal uh, you know, support when they seek uh, refuge in the third country. And I'm sure uh, something good will come out uh, because climate change is a very, I would say, hot button issue in Canada, in Americas, in Europe. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Tasmima, you had a query. Uh, would you like to ask it? <laughs> Okay, so um, Tasmima's question is basically, um, 
Displacement is caused by human, as I propounded in my lecture. And now uh, she's asking that it's a very tough position to be for both the uh, both being a host country and the guest communities. So um, they don't. Uh, I mean, how to really balance uh, this issue? Well, uh, what I mean, this is what is my uh, final uh, thought uh, in today's lecture that. Uh, folks, displacement uh, is a phenomena, actually. It's very, very old. People moved from places to places, uh, you know, centuries, millennia. But what is important nowadays is to understand and open your, you know, let's say, I would say hearts and minds, because both are important here, right? Not only emotion, but all the practicality, because you have to calculate a lot of things hosting a large population, right? But in both senses, I would say that uh, our empathy is more important. And we have to really think in a very bigger perspective that uh, this is the reason uh, this community has left their places and now living with us. Because if we lose empathy, then we lose a part of humanity. And you might be, you might accuse me that it's, it's easy to say from Canada, totally understandable. I'm not in Bangladesh. Uh, I don't understand uh, possibly the intricacies of uh, hosting uh, such a large population for over six years. But um, let me tell you that I have traveled enough. I do extensive research on Rohingyas. Uh, this is why I always advocate that if as a host community, if you lose empathy, uh, then these people have nowhere to go, remember. Uh, think about Rohingyas, if, if you really don't want them, what they would do? They have no places to go back. And it is possibly uh, applicable to 90% of the displaced persons that the statistics I've shown, they have nowhere to fall back to. And just, just try to understand uh, that this is the precarious situation they are in. So if they don't have any fallback places, should they just you know die or should they just, you know, uh, uh, get lost uh, in our whole discussions of who's supposed to do what. So empathy is the key, and I always request um, everyone, uh, you know, from the government to non-government organizations to educators like you, young people, that have empathy because uh, this is not something Rohingyas ever wanted themselves to remain here and uh, remain, uh, you know, hopeless for a very long period of time. Dr. Kausar, yes, sir. If you can allow me, sir, I would like to say, as you <laughs> yes. said, that there are scope for you to even challenge your views. <laughs> right. I do not dare to challenge your views, <laughs> but I have, a, <laughs> I have a submission. Why don't we think that who all are responsible for this Rohingya crisis behind this screen? Who created this force? Who are, what, what is their interest? Who all are those powers? Why they have done it? Then we have the answers. But if you look for those, you are in in a, in a threatening position. Your existence will be in question. <laughs> they are very powerful. Discuss those. Then probably these young stars will tomorrow tomorrow's leader will think and uh, have a different perception about the whole world. Thank you, uh, Colonel Jahir's observation is hundred percent authentic and legitimate. And I naturally did not uh, tailor my speech onto that because maybe that is another discussion. But today I thought of. Uh, I know scoping my lecture onto just displacement phenomena and uh, the international law. So uh, in responding to Colonel Jahi's observation, folks, he's very right that, and it, just if you, you know, uh, relate to one of my comments that the principal two causes of displacement, one we might attribute to climate and second is directly man-made. So in both cases, think about Colonel Jahi's observation, the whole case of Rohingyas, was caused by another group of human beings, i.e. the Myanmar military, or in, in broader framework, the government of Myanmar. Because in the first case, they would have not been displaced. And we would have not been talking about security and et cetera, et cetera, over the past six years, had they not been displaced in the first place. And that is what Colonel Jari is alluding to. And he's very right also that, is there any international norms, rules, regulation to hold accountable of the generals of Myanmar or in general, the, the leadership of NLD, the then led by Aung San Suu Kyi. And to respond to Colonel Johir's uh, uh, this uh, humble question, 
It is an astounding no. We do not have any protocol tools in international community to deal with an independent sovereign nation state. That is what we are struggling when we write policy options for Rohingya crisis. And as you know, we advocate uh, uh, to Canadian government with regards to conflict resolution and crisis. And I met Honorable Bob Ray a couple of times, who was the personal envoy of Canada to this conflict. And we discussed several things. And in our last book launch, Honorable Bob Ray was himself present. You can, uh, you can uh, subscribe our channel, you can find it. Uh, so uh, we asked this question, like Colonel Zahid, that why can't we hold responsible for the atrocities that the generals have done uh, with, the, with regards to Rohingyas? And unfortunately, you might say that, sir, we have ICC and ICJ. The Court of Justice deals with the nation state. Court of uh, Criminal Court does, deals with individuals. But remember, it will take decades to even punish them. Think about the Bosnia-Herzegovina case, how long it took. Think about the Somalian and Rwandan uh, you know, case of genocide, how long it took. So within these two, three decades, just imagine millions of people are displaced and they're stuck in a limbo in, in, a, in a different part of the world. So uh, in conclusion, uh, Colonel Zahir, there is no instrumental uh, instruments available uh, in, the, uh, in the international arena, including the Security Council. Because again, another dis discussion here, Security Council is highly polarized because of Russia and China and rest of the world. So we do not have any, 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 you know, any place to really seek justice or implement justice for the displaced. Thank I you, hope, sir. Thank you very I, much. I hope I could answer your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And I don't want to leave uh, you folks with uh, desperations or frustration today, but I am frustrated as a social scientist here, and we advocate for you know, a host of conflict uh, resolution issues because it is at the end of the day, uh, folks, it, it goes back to the host country always. Because host country, as I said, that you know, in today's world, there's no empty space, right? There's no mountains and seas available anymore. You really have to go somewhere where other people are already living in. So you have to, you know, you are plugging into some of the places and they have their own rules and standards as you rightly discussed, national security, livelihood, et cetera. So how do you deal with that? And the only way is to make the host countries more hospitable, you know, give them funding. So that is the only way we do. And I understand our high commission here and uh, His Excellency, he does come to our webinar very frequently. Uh, and, uh, and he also commented that uh, giving aid to Rohingyas is not the solution, right? I mean, yes, they need their basic human needs, but the overarching need is what? Compelling Myanmar to take them back. So is it happening? I don't know. I mean, recently I saw there's a talk going on a military government is uh, you know, uh, trying to do a pilot project, which they did actually try earlier, uh, which miserably failed. Uh, but the question is, reflecting upon Colonel Jahi's observation, that Western countries should figure out something else other than giving money. Because the root cause and root resolution, if you might say root resolution, or the fundamental resolution is Rohingyas going back to their places of birth and places where they were ousted. Other than this, there is no resolution. Thank you. So I think uh, we'll end uh, our uh, session today. And uh, sir, I have a question. Oh, you have a question? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, okay. sorry to interrupt you. Okay, maybe this is the last question. Oh, okay, last maybe question. Okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, since uh, Sar is maybe running out of, out of time. Yeah. <laughs> or if you have time, I think uh, it's fine. But uh, some, they, they have, I, I can see no, no, there I, are some I, other I, questions I, for queries. I, I, I do have time. I have no, no trouble because it is Friday night. It is 11.44 PM here. But I have enough energy uh, because I really love uh, this atmosphere. This is what I am passionate about. And uh, uh, and you are from Bangladesh, all of you. So I have an obligation. So I have I have no problem because I'm not going anywhere at the dead of the night. Go ahead. Okay, please. Uh, thank you. Carry on. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, answering my first question. Apni bola chilen je we should have empathy to accept them. Ta hole ki amader empathy ki based on religion hobe. 
uh, for example, up to the um, Syrian refugee crisis, eh? um, European countries, eh, je treatment, our uh, Ukrainian cr refugee crisis, eh, modhe je, tade je welcoming treatment. Why there's so much difference? Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, in the question of empathy, uh, folks, uh, it is important how the empathy grows. So basic question of, uh, of, uh, of you possibly is pointing towards uh, why people become more empathetic to different ethno-religious or uh, ethnic or religious groups. In reality, this is what happens. I am in Canada. Canada accepts a lot of refugees and all these things. And I already told you that we do not understand why Canadian government have not accepted at least a token. Yes, it is not possible to take you know, 1 million uh, Rohingyas back to Canada, it's not. But as a token, like Canadian government has done with regards to Yazidis, Syrians, and of course the large number of Ukrainians recently, but they have not. So perforce we are you know, kind of uh, motivated to think what is the cause behind it? You are also right, in many cases we have seen uh, uh, an easier route of immigration and settlement uh, for you know, uh, similar ethno-religious uh, groups. Even in the case of Ukraine war, where Canada has accepted thousands and thousands, it was even discussed that whether uh, it is Canadian biasness towards Ukrainians than that of other groups, because Rohingyas, for example, are there stuck. Uh, there are many Venezuelans, as I showed you, the five largest displacement, uh, except the Ukraine war. So uh, is it a biasness that we inherently practice in terms of practicing empathy, showing empathy? I would say partly, partly that is the case. And second thing, uh, I would also remind you that going beyond in empathy, it is something host country's decision. Host country decides based on number of things like economic uh, you know, rehabilitation. For example, when uh, Canada opened up its border for Syrians, and it happened uh, in a peak time when liberal government was uh, coming into power, uh, led by Justin Trudeau, and one of his election agenda that he would uh, quickly, you know, in a couple of months, he will resettle 25,000 Syrian refugees. So one of the motivation was Syrian refugees were highly educated. They might not be able to speak English like you and I do, because English not is their second or third language there. Uh, but they're highly educated because Syria was a very stable country, as you know, before 2011, right, Arab Spring. So uh, one of the considerations was that, yes, let's bring them here and then uh, uh, you know, educate them in English and with their skills, like many are doctors, surgeons, you know, entrepreneurs, et cetera, uh, they will quickly adapt to this society. And this adaptation is, is the key in terms of resettlement in the Western countries. They do think in their policy side how best this group of people that we are bringing in can integrate socially, economically, and politically, culturally into this new society. And based on these considerations, they decide who to come and who uh, might not come. Thank you, sir. Welcome. So I can see there are uh, two more. Uh, Ra Rahim. Okay, now we have finished the one of Rahim. Now, Shin, is it your uh, question? Madam, you... Madam, I yes. saw Rahul Amin raising his hands for a long time. <laughs> oh, Rahul, I thought Rahul asked a question yeah. or gave his opinion or Rahul? Uh, Ma'am, sorry. Can has go on. Okay, okay. Maybe Rahul, you can go on. Ma'am, I made the question to Chilo. Our question to answer. Thanks for question. Thank you, Mr. Pesi. So, our next question is about curiosity. Okay. So, we are looking at some of the poorest students. So, we are looking at some of the worst scholars. So, we are looking at some of the worst students. So, we are looking at some of the worst students. So, we are looking at some of the worst students. So, we are looking at some of the so, I have a question about the refugees in the convention. 
আসছে কিন্তু আইডিপির জন্য কোনো কনভেনশন নাই তো রেফিউজির ক্রাইসিস থেকে আমরা দেখতেছি যে বেশিরভাগ রেফিউজির একটা টেন্ডেন্সি থাকে ওয়েস্টার্ন কান্ট্রির দিকে একটু যাওয়ার তো সেখান থেকে লেসন নিয়ে কি ওয়েস্ট ইচ্ছা করি কোনো কনভেনশন দিচ্ছে না আইডিপির জন্য যে তাদের জন্য একটু হার্মফুল হইতে পারে বা এরকম কিছু একটা <laughs> well it's a well known question so um, i will uh, only um, you know remind you that the refugee convention was uh, uh, finally drafted back in 1951 just imagine 1951 and after that we only have had one protocol in 1967 which is also known as uh, statute roma statute so after that you see practically nobody thought about uh, any additional protocol or any addendum uh, to the original convention itself see nothing so far but uh, you know uh, i will be reluctant to comment on whether western countries do uh, you know uh, you know intentionally uh, sort of don't want to sign up with or come up with the convention because they have to uh, take in refugees uh, but i would say that uh, in the west especially uh, countries like ours in canada uh and europe uh, in general and uk uk takes a lot of refugees uh, so the essential question is uh, about geopolitics let me also give you one statistics if you remember the vietnam war in 70s when uh, saigon you know uh, it fall to the you know and the americans were uh, quickly uh, evacuating uh, from saigon uh, within a couple of years nearly 1 million vietnamese actually arrived in canada they are called boat people and you see we hardly know about this fact remember 1 million is not is not a joke uh, bringing and you know transporting 1 million people back in early 80s uh, uh, here in canada from vietnam but they, it happened and this comes to the point that uh western countries possibly don't go to un and spend time on refugees because you know it is true that it is not the priority rather priority is geopolitics why you may ask question that sir uh canada took uh, so many of the vietnamese you know why because at that time it was the peak of cold war so canada as a part of west thought that these people should not fell into the sphere of influence of communist russia or ie communist or, or rather communist china so they are actually saving them uh, to to bring them into their fold into their club rather than exposing them to be recruited uh, by either china or russia those who are communist so that was the prevalent notion of bringing them and rehabilitating them here so at the end uh, uh, mr amin Uh, it is it is it, your observation is right and i do agree with you that uh, western countries have least interest uh, uh, you know going there and and also uh, there is another reason that western countries actually do not get involved in these things uh, anymore because you know at the end you can ratify a convention some 90 countries will sign it off then what there is no enforcement right all the un conventions are not enforceable remember even when we talk about 1948 genocide case and folks uh, by the way uh, i also lead a not for profit organization is called bongobundu center for bangladesh studies and if you visit our site uh, site you will find we are working on bangladesh genocide and its recognition outside what i have seen particularly that despite of all these written materials rules definitions and consequences we we actually have no system to m- make somebody responsible and held accountable we don't actually and going back to colonel jahis observation we don't look at 1948 convention of genocide article 2 clearly specifies in four steps what is genocide despite 1948 think about how many genocides happened even in the case of bangladesh genocide people still deny that it was not a genocide in the west mostly and even some corners in bangladesh maybe somebody has different opinions of the bangladesh genocide so this is the problem uh, in the international level that you know you might ask that why canada doesn't take a lead because canada thinks that oh, what does it matter actually you know another convention another ratification 50 countries sign off then what no enforcement 
Thank you. Sir, I have another question. Sir, I have a question on the displacement. So, I have a question the South, highly criticized America and particularly US. So, I have a question on the students who have criticized the students. মানে তারা এই জিনিসগুলো কিভাবে দেখে ওয়েস্টার্ন স্টুডেন্টরা বেসিক্যালি আর কি এটা আমার জানার ইচ্ছা ছিল আর কি নো অল দিস থিংস সো আই ডু ইয়া অ্যাবসলুট আই ডু টিচ আ কোর্স অ্যাজ ইউ আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড फ्रॉम মাই বায়ো ইজ কলড স্পেশাল টপিকস ইন জিওপলিটিক্স এন্ড উই ডু টক अबाउट টেরোরিজম এন্ড কাউন্টার টেরোরিজম কোয়াইট আবিট অ্যাকচুয়ালি আই এম জাস্ট ফিনিশিং মাই কোর্স উইন্টার টার্ম জাস্ট নেক্সট উইক সো মাই অবজারভেশন ইজ দ্যাট নন বাংলাদেশি স্টুডেন্টস আর অ্যাকচুয়ালি far more motivated to understand the causes of displacement humanitarian activities and all these things i am teaching this course for over 4 years now yeah 4 years now i i i can't remember if i have any bangladeshi students in my course none zero so i would say that it is actually reverse bangladeshi students coming here in canada i'll only say i will not generalize because i don't know right I only know about my university and here, most probably in the University of Manitoba. Bangladesh students are least interested in understanding the causes of displacement or you know, uh, causes of terrorism, human rights, climate change, least interested. It is a little frustrating for me because uh, like you folks, you are so interested. So, but I don't see similar interest here. Rather, non-Bangladeshis who I taught over four years, they have, they have taken my course, they have written, some of them works for me in my not-for-profit still. And I do offer practicum, uh, just visit my site. I'm, I'm just typing, uh, typing it out here. So this is the organization that I run. I regularly hire people. So if you want to work for us, you can always come and work for me, uh, for us. Uh, so, <clears throat> and this is the second organization that I also lead, particularly for Bangladesh. Uh, and there's a call for genocide scholarship. If you guys are interested, visit the bcbscanada.org and uh, drop your application uh, because we are offering a scholarship uh, for people like you if you're uh, interested in genocide study. So at the end, uh, I mean, I would say that um, Bangladesh students here, I don't see much interest, um, rather it is the you know opposite way. Thank you, sir. So, so we are at the very end of our today's session. Uh, so again, I would like to thank our today's guest speaker, Professor Doctorate uh, Khasar Ahmed for taking time out of his busy schedule to deliver the uh, talk uh, in front of our undergrad level students. I think uh, the uh, and on behalf of uh, the Department of International Relations, the department um, uh, where I teach, and also my institution, Bangladesh University of Professionals, I, I would like to thank again, uh, sir, uh, for actually giving some wonderful uh, clarification of the queries of our students. Um, actually, we have started this uh, type of programs with uh, guest lecture lecturers, uh, and in this series, maybe this is the first uh, uh, with a Bangladeshi scholar. I mean, uh, Bangladeshi scholar based in a foreign country. So actually, uh, uh, we appreciate this initiative and I would like to thank um, Director of Office of the International Affairs, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, retired uh, Joish sir, for taking these initiatives and giving our students this the wonderful chance to uh, get uh, familiar with the, um, the, the contemporary uh, global issues or politics, because for me, as, as I offered the course, refugees, migrants and internally displaced person, IDPs um, uh, at BUP, at, um, uh, I, I think th this is a, uh, this is a, this is a very, one of the uh, crucial topics or very significant topics uh, in the, uh, for our students. And they got to learn many new dimensions of 
human displacement today, though their interest, I, I have noticed that was focused on mostly on the refugee, Rohingya refugee crisis, the Rohingya crisis. Uh, and uh, sir, would you like to uh, tell anything, uh, sir, Joey, sir? So we are going to no. actually end no. our discussion. No. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, I would li also like to thank Dr. Kausar, uh, not only for this today's session, it was he who took initiative to send Professor Adam Miller to have a session with the BUP students, if you remember. Probably it was on genocide, if I'm not wrong. So that, yes. that was also very interesting. So Professor uh, Dr. Kausar he has a lot of feelings for his root country, Bangladesh. With that view, he always tried to help uh, the, 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 our education system or try to contribute. And I also request him that if you want to go for research with him in some capacity, he told me that you have, the students have the scope to doing research with him. And eventually it will help you to lead, uh, go, go to Canada or some other country for, for further degree. So I humbly request Dr. Kausa to uh, continue his effort and he's coming on 7th April again with some other batch. Yes, some other batch. Uh, right, so I certainly appreciate your, your uh, sincere devotion and, and your preparation and your your uh, thinking process to deliver additional knowledge and information to our students. Please join me giving me a big blow of hands, please. <laughs> Thank you. All the students. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I request. Thank you. Please, no, absolutely. Sir. Thank you, Colonel Zahir. Uh, uh, actually, it is mutual. Uh, it's not that I can always, uh, you know, uh, 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 reach out and it will happen. Uh, it is also Colonel Zahir's and uh, his office, uh, and they have reached out to me too, and they responded quite uh, promptly. Uh, about Adam Muller, um, Adam Muller is the director of Peace and Conflict Studies program in University of Manitoba. He's very close to me. Uh, we work together on many issues. Uh, he's a genocide scholar too. Um, so uh, when there was an opportunity because he was actually uh, attending Liberation War Museum's uh, winter school uh, organized by Mr. Mofid al uh, with who we work also uh, from BCBS platform. So I quickly uh, touched base with Colonel Zahid that, sir, can you arrange um, a small get together or whatever? And it was promptly arranged. And I thank Colonel Zahid and his team to arrange it. It, 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 uh, it has actually impressed him. And I'm sure uh, if you guys are applying for PACS program, uh, there is, uh, he has all the feelings for Bangladesh because he was impressed with your energy, with your enthusiasm, which, which really matters here. And to me also, and I'm, you know, I, I am a Bangladeshi. I, I do have all the energy to do whatever it takes uh, to support any one of you. Uh, feel free. I have given you uh, the websites, of both the organizations, and subscribe our YouTube channel. We regularly hold uh, webinars on various topics. And as Colonel Jahid mentioned, uh, I look forward for any joint collaborative work, uh, which one is I'm already doing with uh, uh, Dhaka University PACS department. We have signed an MOU with them. So they're going to send their students and faculty members here and vice versa. So <clears throat> something like that we would like to do with BUP uh, under the leadership of Colonel Zahir <clears throat> and my course mate, the uh, uh, chancellor, vice chancellor here, General Mahbub. Um, so uh, thank you once again, folks, for uh, you know being with me almost uh, nearly two hours now. Uh, in closing, uh, let me uh, just share my final thoughts uh, before you go, because we might not meet each other uh, ever, right? Uh, this is the last time we are meeting each other, maybe. Um, so in closing, uh, the history of human displacement is a complex and often difficult one, and marked by conflict, inequality, and displacement on a massive scale. Remember the numbers that we discussed and we shared today. However, it is important to remember that the members of a global family we have a shared responsibility to support those who have been forced to flee their homes and seek safety and security elsewhere. Before we blame anyone else, look at you, look at your own place because you are also responsible because at the end of the day, you are also a human being. While some individuals may choose to move voluntarily in search of new opportunities and experiences, the vast majority of those who are displaced do so as a result of conflict which is totally out of their control, and persecution or other forms of hardship. As human beings, we have a moral obligation to provide assistance and support to those who are in need, regardless of their background and circumstances. This means working together to address the root causes of displacement, promoting peace and stability, and providing humanitarian aid to those who are affected by crisis and conflicts 
around the world is of essence. And by recognizing the shared humanity and of individuals, of all the individuals and working together to support those who are in need, we can help to build a more just and equitable world for all. Remain in peace, uh, remain well in uh, the month of Ramadan. I wish all of you the best of your ability in pursuing your formal career. And thanks once again, Kangul Zahir and for his team, and Ushri, uh, Lisa for your uh, moderation. I appreciate the time. And till then, uh, stay well, stay by, and uh, goodbye from my end. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kausa. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. I mean, Dr. Professor Ushri, and all our students. Thank you very much. Hope to see you in some other occasions. And uh, Dr. Kausa, we'll talk later on. Thank and you, we'll sir. see each other on 7th April. Thank you, Thank sir. you, uh, Ushri Borwa. Give a complimentary thanks from <laughs> on behalf of Dr. Kalsa and from Prof. from our respect visit to all you students. Huh? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.